I want to start this episode by talking about loss, and about risk, and about the lessons we learn. I'm going to be talking about these things in the context of EVE Online and losing an imaginary internet spaceship, but if you follow me through this thought process and find yourself thinking that maybe some of these ideas could be applied to things that actually matter in your real life, I don't think that would be a mistake. We lost Thomas the Thorax in a gate camp. That is going to set us back. It's difficult. It's just a game. But it hurts. You invest your time and effort into something, and it goes wrong, and it, it stings. It's easy when something like that happens to turn it on yourself and say, that was so dumb. I'm so dumb. I shouldn't have done that. I'm never going to do that again because I would be so much better off right now if I hadn't. But we're operating in a sphere of risk in EVE Online, especially in LOSEC. And honestly, we're operating in a sphere of risk in everything we do in our lives in and out of game. And in that context, you're rolling the dice. And when the dice come up and deal you the consequences, that doesn't necessarily mean it was a mistake to roll them. We weren't dumb. We are going to do that again. If we build another thorax and start once again flying it around low sec, it's not only possible that we will lose that thorax as well in another gate camp or in some other way, it is, given enough time, inevitable. But the lesson we're going to take from that is not that we shouldn't be flying cruisers in low sec. That's the wrong lesson. If we do this thing, something bad might happen, therefore we shouldn't do this thing, is a trap. Yes, if we do this thing, something bad might happen. But how likely is it to happen? And how bad is the bad thing? How hard will it be to recover from? And what do we stand to gain with each roll of the dice where it doesn't happen? With the amount of carefree low sec gate hopping that we've done on this run, we've honestly been improbably fortunate that we haven't lost a ship we cared about before now. We've been in situations that were dangerous before. We've had T3 cruisers uncloak on us. We've jumped through gates and seen hostiles sitting there on grid. And so far, we'd always gotten away from them because I am familiar with the tactics that are involved with escaping in those situations. But with the way we're flying, we are going to get ourselves into some situations where escape just isn't viable. And we knew that going in. None of that risk assessment has fundamentally changed just because Thomas died. I mean, one of the lessons we're going to learn is we're going to remind ourselves that yes, gate camps are more common than what we have seen up to this point, but they aren't ubiquitous. And we're also going to remind ourselves that our loss here is constrained. Our thorax BPO acts as a something of a save point, and we know how to get the materials to build another one. In fact, I think we have most of the materials that we need already there to build it. And as for that sense of loss and regret, that's entirely psychological. It's something that we can choose just to let go of. It's gone. So we are going to build another thorax. We are going to put it at risk again, and we're going to reap some rewards while we're doing so. And even if it dies straight away, that's just another data point will rebuild again. You can never reduce the risk to zero, not in EVE Online and not in any aspect of your actual life. You will screw up and you will get hurt, or you won't screw up and you will get hurt anyways. If you focus too much of your energy on reducing that risk to zero, all you're really doing is building a prison for yourself. What you can do is look at the practical ways of reducing the risk Look at the cost of energy, of time, of anxiety associated with those risk reductions and decide which ones are worth pursuing and which ones aren't. There are things that we can do, even with the restrictions of this run, where we can't be scouting ahead with an alt, um, where there's no real plausible way for us to get our hands on a cloaking device which might help us run gate camps. There are still things we can do to mitigate the risk to reduce the number of situations that are fatal for us. 
not only when we're flying Thomas, but in our general activities around Losec. So, we're going to buy an Atron blueprint, and we're going to buy some blueprints for some agility mods, and then we're today going to go exploring. This is Bill. Bill wants to build a Cinnaball and join the Angel Cartel cause in Zarzak, but he's not making it easy on himself. Atron Blueprint, 2.1 million isk. Small polycarbon engine housing one blueprint, 125,000 isk. Small, low friction, nozzle joints one blueprint, 125,000 isk. Initial stabilizer one blueprint, 54,000 isk. Oh, and while we were in high sec, we picked up a few exploration focused BPOs as well. Data analyzer one blueprint, 330,000 isk. Relic analyzer one blueprint, 330,000 isk and range finding array one blueprint, 600,000 isk. Small mimetic algorithm bank one blueprint, 125,000 isk. Small gravity capacitor upgrade one blueprint, 125,000 isk. Our new BPOs have already built and we are ready to go. This is our probe, our exploration frigate. His name is Diego and he is fully equipped. In one of his high slots, he has a core probe launcher one with eight core scanner probes already in. And in two of his mids, he has a data analyzer and a relic analyzer. These three mods, the probe launcher and the two analyzers, are really all that an exploration frigate like Diego needs to serve his fundamental job. He scans down the signatures and then he uses the analyzers to hack the cans in them. In fact, for any given signature of the like basic exploration sites we're gonna be doing, He'll only need a data analyzer or a relic analyzer, and I was even considering flying him with one equipped and one in cargo, so that the fourth spot could be used up by a scan range finding array to boost our scan strength. Except that it turns out that, unbeknownst to me, scan range finding arrays actually have Morphite in their build cost. And Morphite is something that we can't acquire right now. I don't know if we ever will, but for the time being, at least that's on the back burner. At least the BPO was cheap. And even though we can't fit the scan range finding array, we have built and fit a small gravity capacitor upgrade, which gives us a very similar flat boost to our scan strength. The rest of these modules are not directly contributing to Diego's core scanning and hacking job. Instead, they are focused on broadly increasing Diego's survivability and flexibility. The micro warp drive, of course, will help us get around sites faster. And then for tank, we've equipped a small shield extender, a damage control, and an EM shield rig. That's not much tank, but it's enough to survive a smart bomb, which is something we're going to be worried about as we're jumping around through low sec gate to gate looking for sites. And of course, jumping around low sec gate to gate, we're also going to be worried about gate camps. And to that end, we fit two inertial stabilizers and a polycarbon engine housing, all of which increase Diego's agility to the point that he can now enter warp from a dead standstill in less than three seconds. That's not quite fast enough to be technically unlockable, but it means that it would take a really concentrated gate camp that was really on their ball to have a chance of catching him. In terms of our broader assessment of risk that we talked about earlier, this seems like a practical degree of risk mitigation. And then other than that, we've just got the salvager and a random blaster and three drones in the drone bay. Um, we probably won't be using any of these things. If we end up having to shoot something with Diego, something has gone horribly wrong. But we've got the spots. We've got the drone bay. We might as well. Now let's get out there and find some signatures. So cosmic signatures are found up here in the probe scanner window, the same place we've been finding our cosmic anomalies up until now. We've seen them plenty of times. They're those red lines that just say cosmic signature 0.0%. Uh, you can't warp to them until you scan them down. And for the first time, we're ready to do that. But there are none here in Minar. So we're going to head over to Olide. Not because we're going to scan there. Olide's high sec and scanning is an activity in space. But because there's some low traffic, low sec systems on the other side of Olide. And that way we can stop in and pick up our sister's core scanner probes. The sister's probes give such a boost to scan strength that it just makes 
a world of difference, and I never thought we were going to get to use them, so I'm so excited that our very first scan with Diego in this run is going to be Sisters Powered. Okay, in a deal, we are alone in system, and there is one Cosmic Signature. Let's find it. We're warping to a safe spot first, because while you're probe scanning, you do have to be in space. We don't want to be sitting at a station or a gate or anything, because we're going to be distracted by the probe UI. So we want to make sure that we have some isolation from anyone else who might come into system. Or we're going to have to be watching D-Scan. Ideally, an exploring ship like this would fit a cloak, maybe where we have this useless blaster. But building a cloak is something that's not viable for us right now, so we're just going to have to be on the ball. Okay, so in order to track down this signature, the first thing we have to do is launch our probes. And then when we open up our solar system map, we will find that the probe UI is open. We're going to click on the signature, and we'll see that it's already marked as a sphere. That's the sphere showing its estimated location before we probe scan at all. Um, so we're going to increase our probes to maximum range, which gives us all of these spheres. We're using the default uh, pinpoint formula, formula, which is honestly a pretty decent one. So it gives us this these eight spheres overlapping in this one sort of lemon-shaped slice in the middle. And our goal is to have whatever we're trying to find be in the middle of this lemon. So we're just going to position the center of our scan probes on the center of the signature. We're going to analyze and we're going to see what happens. Okay. Uh, we not only got a ping on it, but now there's another signature has spawned in space. So in a way, I kind of want to go for the new signature first, because whatever it is, whatever the other one is, there's a good chance when there's only one signature in system that someone else has scanned it down and found it to be not worth anything to them. So let's try scanning this new signature. Okay, the signature is showing us two dots connected by a line. It's really easy to do the scanning when it shows you just a single dot or a sphere. You're like, okay, the signature is here somewhere. We're just going to center our probes on that spot. Bang. But what do you do when you have two dots connected by a line? What does that even mean? I think that in order to explain this properly, I'm going to need to cut away to a whole little interlude. So meet me back here in a second. Let's imagine you're playing hide-and-seek on a flat two-dimensional plane. I mean, right, that's a terrible place to play hide-and-seek. But let's say you're blindfolded or the plane is filled with, like, trees or fog or corn or something, so you can't see the guy who's hiding. So you're here, and he's somewhere. You have no way of knowing what direction you have to go, but let's imagine you somehow do get to know how far away he is. Like, say, he smells real bad of onions. And you sniff the air, and you're like, Yes, by this ambient level of pungency, I can surmise that Gerald is exactly 100 meters away. So, bam! Even though you can't know which direction the smell is coming from, you now know that Gerald is somewhere on this circle, centered on you with a radius of 100 meters. It doesn't help much, but now imagine your friend Agatha is over here, and she shouts out to you, I can smell Gerald too! He's only 50 meters away from me! Now you have two circles, and Gerald has to be on the circumference of both of them. Therefore, he must be stinking it up either here or here. But then your buddy May pipes up, and they're like, Hey, I'm over here, and I smell him too. May, obviously, is going to say that Gerald is either 90 meters away or 110. And just like that, you know exactly where he's hiding. Boom. Gotcha, Gerald. Now, there's some fuzziness to this. When you sniff the air, you don't actually know Gerald is exactly 100 meters away. It's more like 100 plus or minus 10. So we end up with this margin of error. He could be anywhere in here. So you move closer, and you smell again. You, May, and Agatha, as you might have guessed, are scan probes. And Gerald is an odiferous cosmic signature. On a flat plane, you always need exactly three distance data points to pin a location down. This is called trilateration. Space, of course, is 3D, so we need a fourth probe, but it's the exact same principle. One probe gets you a sphere, Two probes get you a circle that describes the intersection of the surfaces of those two spheres, and that circle defines a 2D plane, so you're back to our two-dimensional game of hide-and-seek. But here's the trick that some players don't know. 
Imagine we're back in this setup. But imagine now that May can only smell Gerald from a maximum of 100 meters away. So they shout out, I can't smell him at all! No data. You still have two points. Except that you obviously don't. The diagram gives you two points, the scan interface in-game will show you two points, but you know exactly where Gerald is. He's here! Because if he were here, May would have smelled him. And that, in a far more roundabout way than was necessary, is how a good scanner reads the probe UI. Okay, we've got two dots connected by a line. Gerald is in one of these two spots. And look at this spot. It's right in the middle of our lemon wedge. He can't be there. May would have smelled him. So we're going to just assume that our signature is actually over here. And we're going to treat these two dots as though they were in fact one dot. There it is. We know now that it's a combat site. That's interesting. So our scanning, the reason that we built an exploration ship the reason that we need to build an exploration ship is because we need gas to build a cinnaball, and gas is only found in uh, cosmic signature gas sites. So we're going to need a gas harvesting ship in order to get the gas, but we're going to need an exploration ship in order to find the gas. We also need molecular condensers, which are found in data sites, which are again found through exploration. So gas sites and data sites are the things we're really looking for. And right now we're really looking for data sites because we don't have gas harvesters, but we do have a data analyzer. However, there is a lot of stuff that you can find by exploring and a bunch of it, even though it's not really on the Cinnaball shopping list, will be useful to us. This combat site, it could be another Serpentis Narcotics warehouse. We could run it. We could try running it in a destroyer. We could redeem ourselves, get another piece of dead space loot right here in our own backyard. That would be amazing. Um, it could be some other combat site, uh, either too hard for us to run or something we can run uh, very easily. Also, there are relic sites, which give us salvage, and there are wormholes, which could be interesting to us in a lot of different ways, most notably their ability to let you sort of skip over a bunch of gates and get from one end of New Eden to the other without covering the space in between. So we're going to, for the time being, we're going to scan down every signature we find because it's hard to say what is or isn't going to be useful for us. But the main one that's going to progress us towards our goal of building a Cinnaball right now is going to be the data sites. Same deal. Two dots. This one's inside a lemon wedge. This one's not. This one has to be the real deal. Now, scanning would be a lot faster if we had higher scan strength, and there might be some signatures, particularly uh, sort of esoteric ones like the sleeper caches that we won't be able to scan down in our Tech 1 probe um, with the skills that we have. But this combat site's already 67%. I have a feeling we're going to get it on the scan. There we go. Serpentis Phi Outpost. What the hell is a Serpentis Phi outpost? We're going to bookmark that for now, and I will figure out later how tough that is and if we can run it in a catalyst. Hello from the future. I googled it. Serpentis Phi outpost is a DED 410. Would have been perfect for Thomas. Sad face. In the meantime, we'll repeat the exact same thing again. Uh, the exact same scanning routine again on this other signature. I need to set up my scanning hotkeys. I'm used to not having to do this by mouse. The UI for the scanning is a little bit fiddly. Hopefully that explainer that I did for you there makes you understand what's going on here, how these spheres are intersecting and how we're using that to allow us to find out where something is. That's the biggest part, that conceptual bit of it, is the biggest barrier to learning how to scan. Uh, but the UI itself is also a bit of a learning curve. You have to get used to looking in 3D, rotating around. You can move all of your probes with this one cube, and if you grab a surface of it, then that's defining the plane in which you'll be moving them. So this is moving on this plane, and then that, I can center it, and then the only other direction I should need to move it in is this up-down plane, which I can do by grabbing this side or just by using these arrows. 
but just fiddling around to get everything into the right position it takes a little bit of practice and then adjusting the scan probe uh, radius to be the right thing so that you don't waste scans is also a little bit fiddly. But if there's no one else in system, the time pressure is limited. You want to get faster at it so you're more efficient. But if you have to take your time in the beginning, take your time. Oh, it's a wormhole. This is exciting. All right, we're going to save the location of this wormhole. And then we're going to warp to it. See what its deal is. So wormholes always will take you from the system you're in to some other system. They only last for a limited amount of time and they can go to other known space systems or to Pochvin or to Wormhole Space, which is a whole other world with all different rules. If you look at the info of an individual wormhole, however, you can get some hints about how long it's going to last and where it's going to go. The wormhole is beginning to decay and probably won't last another day. That's fine. That's normal. They, most wormholes do not last more than a day. Beginning to decay is actually, you have to sort of learn the like lingo of the wormhole info window. Beginning to decay means that it's actually early in its cycle. So we have, we have more than four hours at least before this wormhole goes anywhere. Also, it leads into unknown parts of space which means it leads to a W space, a wormhole space system, but not one of the most dangerous ones, or also would say dangerous unknown or deadly unknown. And in fact, the lower danger systems can have high tier data and relic sites in them. Maybe we should pop our heads in here. There's a lot of risk to take with our brand new Diego and our Core Sister Scanners probes. But we're doing it. <laughs> 